Just because you have read a verse, have you read it? I find quite often that I will read a verse and it's like I have read it for the first time, even though I know I have read that verse multiple times. It's like the Lord is tapping you on the shoulder and saying, now look at me. Now really read the verse. And let me tell you some things about the verse. So just because you have read a verse does not mean you have read the verse. This past week I came across a verse that I've read many times, but never had seen the complexity of the verse until I read it afresh again and again this past week. This morning I hope to get out of this verse the joy and give to you that I saw more in depth this past week. So at this time, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to stand with me as we read Genesis 2.8. The Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had born. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day and being able to come. Father, I pray, you, you have blessed me with this verse this past week, so I pray that you would just give me the words to say and that your Holy Spirit would touch people this morning with your love for man. Thank you, Lord, and I pray for souls to be one this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. <coughs> just reading the verse, you probably read it and go, oh, that's not. Isn't that sweet? And then what do you do? You go right on into another verse and another verse. But man, that verse has some depth to it. For one thing, you've got to think about what has happened just six days before this verse. Six days. Well, what took place six days before? <clears throat> it says, in the beginning, God. That's what took place, not 60 years, not 60,000 years, but six days before this verse, it says, in the beginning, God. So, I will say, the wonders of God began that we know of six days before this verse. In the beginning, God, there was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and the book begins. We're going to do quite a bit of reading this morning, so bear with me. <clears throat> Genesis 1.1. And it's interesting to me that there are more people that believe John 3.16, because they want to, than they believe Genesis 1.1. Well, now, to me, you take it all or leave it all. I have a tendency of taking it all and not leaving any out. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. you understand what that means? It means that in the beginning, God, not anything else. What else? Nothing else. No black, no white, no vacuum, no air, no what? Nothing. We in our feeble minds have a hard time fathoming nothing. From the time we were almost conceived, we felt, heard, moved. But here it says, in the beginning, God. God created the heavens, the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Verse 3, Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. We're going to pause as I go along in reading this text. And here is a great place to pause, because there's something here you might miss. Notice that God made everything... Uh, by verse 14, there about. And by verse 14, God made the sun. But here, in verse 3, he makes light. 
If God hadn't made light, the sun couldn't produce light because there would be no light. Amen. Is that deep? Amen. So there would be a sun out here that didn't produce light because, except for God made light. There would be a sun out here that didn't produce heat because God made heat. What was in the beginning? In the beginning, God. No light, no heat, no sun. So God made the sun, then he had to make heat to go along with the sun, and he had to make light to go along with the sun. Wow. Some of you are looking at me like, are you kidding me? No. I am not. Verse 4. God said, let the light, uh, light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the, the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. Well, Roger, that actually means a uh, hundred thousand million years. No, it means, in my book, it means one day. One day. Now, whether it's 23 hours, 24 hours, 26 hours, in my thinking, it's 24 hours. He made these things. 24 hours, in my opinion. Let's read on. Uh, verse 5. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. And God said, let there be the expanse in the midst of the waters, and it was separate, uh, separate the waters from the, uh, from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day. And God said, let the Waters below the heaven be gathered into one place and let the, the dry land appear, and it was so. Do you understand? I, we can't, but when it says, and it was so, it was so. It happened. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. Amen. Verse 12, the earth brought forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them, after their kind, and God saw it was good. Verse 13. There was evening and there was morning a third day. Let us pause there. So on the third day, God made vegetation. He made plants, he made fruit trees, he made all these things, and we needed mowers. <laughs> Wow. So all these things by day three he made. Verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Verse 15. And let them for be for lights in the expanse for the heavens to give light on the earth and it was so. <clears throat> Verse 16. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. Oh, but now don't miss this part. This is a great part. He made the stars also. Oh, yeah. While he was at it, he threw in about a billion stars. He had a few moments left in this day. So he thought, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to make a billion or so stars. And it was so. And it was so. Isn't that great verse? It's almost like an afterthought. He made the stars also. 
liking the earth and the sun and the moon and the vegetation, he decided to throw in about a billion stars. Okay, back to our story, verse 17. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness and God saw it was good. There was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves, with which the water swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after their kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let, uh, and let birds multiply on the earth. We're coming back to that verse in just a moment. There was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, uh, uh, creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeped on the uh, ground after its kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, back to that verse, it says, and God said, let there be, and it was so, and it was good, and God blessed it. And you read that God made the beast of the earth, and it was good, and God blessed them. That's the first time in Scripture the word blessed is used. A footnote. God blesses, enables the creatures to reproduce and enjoy all that he had made for them. So here's the first time you read God blessed anything and they, he blesses them to multiply. Unless God blesses, there would be no multiplying. Ooh, think about that. Now we come to some verses that show God's love for mankind. And this is what we're getting to. Verse 26. Now this is deep. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, hear me. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Whereas previously God's act uh, and God said. But here it says, let us make man in our image. But the first five days it said, and God said. So now why did God bring in the triune Godhead into this man? I put a lot of thought in. God here addresses the members of the Godhead. This would be more of a corporate decision than the rest of it. Not that the rest of it, all three didn't agree because they did, but here is more of a corporate decision. Why? Because the Father would be more involved and the Son would be involved and the Holy Spirit would be involved in man. His son would give his life 
LD. This would be more of a corporate decision. It is not that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were not involved in making and deciding the first five days, but with this creation, all would be more personally involved. This was a major decision that involved all three. The main man in the image of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? In his nature, person, personality, in his moral, spiritual capabilities, in his emotion, intellect, conscience and will, man stands apart from all other created beings. Now, y'all miss this, because I've missed this for years. With all other creatures, God started with the body. He started with plant life. He started with Water. He started with fish. He started with animals. And he started with their bodies. With man, he started with his inner being and then finally made the body for man. Is that good? Amen? With only man, he says, I'm more interested in the internal than I am the external. And I'm going to make man in my image. And inside of man is my goodness my abilities, my things. Morally, man is like God because God chose it to be that way. Amen. Woo! Man. Did he love man or what? In his very nature, person, God does not begin with man's body. He begins with man's inner spiritual Indeed, reflection to the creation creation of man's body is a is almost an afterthought. Two seven. Look at two seven. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the the breath of life, and man became a living being. But he created the body after he decided what was going into this body. He created. Amen. Yeah. It was like the body was an afterthought. Oh yeah, we need something to put this in. <laughs> and what does man think about first? The body, not the inner. Man, I gotta exercise today. I gotta do this today. I gotta eat. All those things are good. But it's more important what's inside than what's outside. Can I get an amen? That is good stuff. Amen. Don't you see something else there? I've mentioned this several times. In the, then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. You know what dust is worth? <laughs> Zilch. In fact, we spend a lifetime trying to get rid of dust. We buy stuff at the store to get rid of dust. Well, it was dirt. No, dirt's worth something. We buy dirt to go in our yards. But we get rid of dust. God said, look here. And he reached down and he took the word is dust. He took dust and made man because he wanted to let us know that the outward body is really worth nothing. Yes. It's what's inside the And he breathed life into man. And what did he do by breathing life into man? He took all these ingredients that he had from himself and put them in man by breathing into man. Amen. Man, what a God we have. Amen. Yes. The word formed there is an interesting word because it means it's used 
by the potter shaping clay. And implies that God, if you will, set on a potter's wheel and he designed and carved man. And what do you do when you make a bowl or something? You want to put your valuables in it. So God says, I'm going to put these valuables in this clay pot. <laughs> Our outward body is so fragile. Can I hear that? We are fragile. If you don't believe we're fragile, listen to the news. And we do all these things because the body is wearing out. But guess what? What he put in it will never wear out. So the word formed is used as a potter shaping clay that implies that God became involved in shaping, forming a physical man. So God reached down, took dirt, dust, and he formed man from the earth. And he says when man dies, this clay pot is going back to where it came from. So if you will, God took a very fragile pot called body and place into it priceless. Amen. I want you to hear these statistics. A mere piece of skin the size of a postage stamp. A piece of skin the size of a postage stamp requires three million cells. A yard of blood vessels four yards of nerves, 100 sweat glands, 15 oil glands, and 25 nerve endings. And all of this just came about. Are you kidding me? God, on his wheel, designed these things so perfectly, and we say, isn't that amazing? No, it's not amazing at all. It's what he put in it. It's amazing. Amen. So think about what God did with the dust and water. He threw in a little salt, calcium, carbon, and a little fat here and there, a little iron, a little sulfur, and he mixed it all together and he breathed in it and we're walking around. Amen. Now let me tell you this. You can take and go to uh, town and you can buy all the ingredients you can find in man. You can. Put it together. <laughs> yeah. Let's see what happens when you breathe in it. <laughs> God is good. Amen. God is good. One more thing we need to see here. God said, let us make man. Then God says, created man, then he blessed man, then he formed man. Each step got more personal along the way. Well, let's make man, let's, we created man, we formed man, bless man. No other creature did he do all these things. All right, 2 a. Now think about all these things that have been taking place. You're this, now get the 2A up this now get the 2A. The Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. Oh, hear me. We're getting to some good stuff. God had already created green, vegetation. He had already created fruit trees. He had already created all these things. He had already created Now, God does not need practice, okay? But if you will, he practiced on all this to make a garden. Now, man has been created. He's been born already. Could it be? I like to think about this. Here is Adam watching God personally plant this garden. Now, God has made everything in six days, and now God says, Adam, what's this? 
Now I'm thinking in my own warped mind, he, it's unfair, that, but that's God. He plants something and then a few minutes later he pulled an apple off an apple tree. Because he is God. So Adam watched God plant a garden. Notice the Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden and there he placed. He didn't throw man in. He didn't shove man in. He placed. You see the loving care? He placed man in the garden. Whom he had made? No. Whom he had born. He placed him in the garden. A special place. This was not like any other place. This was a special place. God had already made the sun, the moon, the stars. Uh, animals were roaming around. Please see how personal this is. God planted. He didn't say, let us make a spot or create a spot. He made a spot for man. Oh, something else there, don't you want to make a note? Eden, the word. It's going to be 
we're going to be like Adam. We're going to open our eyes there. Whatever age we're going to be there, I don't know. It doesn't matter. When I'm in total perfect health, it doesn't matter how old I am, does it? Amen. So I'm going to open my eyes in heaven and I'm going to see the glory of heaven. And I'm going to see that, that wolf playing with a lion. And I'm going to be able to pet lions and tigers. And they're going to purr when I pet them. And I'm going to think, oh, that's great. But then I'm going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And everything else is going to pale in comparison. So there's a brand new Eden coming on this year. In the garden, there was two trees that man was not supposed to take of, especially the one tree. One was called the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but a question might be asked. Oh, I love this. One author brought this up. Why is it called the tree of knowledge of good and evil? I haven't knew all about good. Why wasn't it just called the tree of the knowledge of evil? Because Adam knew all about good. He saw all these things that God had made, and it said, and they were all what? Some of it says, and it was very good. Very good. God was and is good to man. By the close of chapter 1, we see that with all man had, he was not complete. Man needed something else to complete him, and we read in verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And here come all the Isn't it interesting that Adam lived in a perfect place with everything he needed, but he was still lonely because he didn't have a helper suitable for him. God said, we'll take care of that too. So God created Eve from the side of Adam. And you know the rest of that story too. I love, I love the fact that if we are careful and, and try our best to relate to God or be there with God, He's going to give you a spouse that's suitable for you. Hear me. Every woman out there is not suitable for every man. Every man is not suitable for every woman. My mother knew I had a good one, and she said one time, more than one time, well, you know, what, what if you had married so-and-so? And I said, I wouldn't have. We would have killed each other. <laughs> God gave me, and hopefully he gives you, he certainly wants to, give you one that is suitable for you. Amen. God did not put Adam out there and say, okay, here is 30 women, choose one. Did he? He said, here is one suitable for you. All right, we're truly about to close it. God still loved man after man sinned. Yes. And God had in mind another more effective, suitable life. Do you remember us talking about in the garden was two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there was a tree in there called the tree of the world. We overlooked that tree a lot of times. He closed the garden to man and says, you can't get in there any longer because you might take up the tree of life. So God says, I've got in mind a better tree of life. And I urge you to take of it. And when you take of it, that valuables inside that I have put in there shall live forever and ever and ever. But you Amen. gotta take of the tree that I'm going to give to you. So God provided man the tree of life, and he urged him to partake of that tree of life. Revelation.
Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. And may enter by the gate into the city. Adam had a garden. We are going to have a city. Because if you have already eaten of the tree of life called Jesus, God provided his son, his son provided his life to become the tree of everlasting life. In the first garden, man got in without eating of the tree of life. But you only get into heaven by eating of the tree. I missed the first garden. But I'm not going to miss it. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for this, this message. Uh, it has blessed me if no one else. Thank you, Lord inside of this message. Be with us this morning if there's anyone, Lord, that uh, does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior. They do not know Jesus as that life that he gives when they come this morning. We're going to have a short invitation time and come. In Jesus' name, amen.